Hello Rams and welcome to another episode of Rams History. Today we'll be discussing urbanization. So the second half of the 19th century becomes known as the age of the middle class. Now this was the group back in 1848 that were actually the revolutionaries. They were the ones looking for greater political power. But as the century moves on, the middle class begins to settle down and they start to focus more on trying to protect what they have from other groups such as the working class and especially the socialists. The middle class will become sort of the most dominant class and they will set the standards for culture, for leisure time, and for behavior that the rest of Europe will follow. Now it's important to remember that the middle class was not monolithic. It was actually made up of several sort of distinct groups the middle class ranged from very wealthy bourgeoisie, who in fact had more wealth than many of the aristocrats, all the way down to what we would today call the lower middle class, or as they called it, the petite bourgeoisie. Uh, these would be, for example, clerks and secretaries, people like that. Uh, the petite bourgeoisie were often barely just removed from the working class. Most of them had actually started life as a working class person but they definitely considered themselves middle class and they spent an awful lot of time and money sort of spending a lot of their income to definitely promote that middle class outlook. Now in the 19th century, we also see the beginning of mass society. So this is a society with a common culture, with common leisure time activities, and it's also a society in which the government begins to play a much larger role in the lives of its citizens. So we've discussed the industrial revolutions, the first and the second, and these revolutions have created really a massive new marketplace of goods. And these consumer goods began reaching the markets uh, an example of this, of course, would be the Crystal Palace in London, which was built entirely out of glass and steel. And the Crystal Palace contained an exhibition hall, which showed off many of these new consumer goods for an admiring public to see. So here we see the interior of the Crystal Palace, and you can see all of the various exhibitions uh, regarding different consumer products. And of course, uh, many, many happy citizens going about looking at all the ages, uh, wonders that were there for their use and consumption. Now these consumer products obviously have to be sold. So a new creation that we see is now the department store. So rather than a specialized store for different things, you can sort of purchase everything you need under one roof and department stores become very popular with the middle class in the second half of the 19th century. This photograph shows a department store in Paris. Of course, Paris was sort of considered the leader to be in fashion uh, all around the world. So if you look at this statement, in 1891, there were 12 department stores in Paris. They employed slightly less than 2,000 people, but 10 years later in 1901, these same stores now have nearly 10,000 employees, and the value of those stores has doubled from over 2 million francs to now at over 4 million francs. So clearly these stores are prospering and doing very well. Now another aspect of mass society is sort of common activities. And across Europe, we start to see the development, for example, of sports. Uh, both as an activity for the middle classes and as a leisure time activity as a spectator sport. And uh, there were a variety of sports, of course, cricket, rugby, cycling. Uh, all of these sports were quite popular with the middle classes through Europe. Uh, and in all cases, there were both professionals and amateurs who would engage in these activities. Now sports had several roles. They were considered to be important in developing the character. Uh, one said, uh, for example, that the British Empire was won on the playing fields of Eton. Uh, so the idea is that sports would develop the mind and the body uh, to create sort of a better citizen. Now I'm not entirely sure what's happening here. This looks like some sort of uh, Victorian WWE guy in the middle kind of reminds me of Braun Strowman a little bit. 
But uh, you can clearly see whatever's happening here, there's obviously a large crowd that's gathered to watch. So not only are people participating in sports themselves, but they are also participating as spectators. Now additionally, besides improving the body and mind, sports actually played into concepts of nationalism. Because in many European countries, sports were actually seen as a way of preparing men for war. So if you look at these two recruiting posters from the World War I era, uh, you can see both cycling and rugby uh, being considered as ways to make men better soldiers. Uh, and so again, there's that nationalistic aspect of sports that by being sportsmen and athletes, uh, we're going to be better citizens and also better soldiers for our countries. Now, another aspect of mass society is the intrusion of government into more and more areas of people's lives. And in the second half of the 19th century, governments across Europe began taking a dominant role in education. Now, previously, education had been somewhat haphazard. The church had done some instruction through schools. Of course, there had been private schools for those wealthy enough to afford them. But a difference now is that governments began producing mass public education for every citizen. And this was considered important for a number of reasons. In a sense, uh, education served many purposes. Of course, in the Industrial Revolution, it was required to have a workforce that was educated so they could carry out complex tasks. Uh, just as in the case of sports, uh, education was seen as a means of promoting and creating good soldiers. Uh, weaponry is becoming more complicated now, so obviously we need educated soldiers who can deal with that. And uh, of course, smart soldiers can carry out complex orders. Now in addition, uh, another reason for education has to do with voting. As uh, voting increases across the continent and as more and more people are given the franchise, nations felt it was critical to educate their voters so that they could hopefully, presumably, make good decisions at the polls. So voting was considered to be such a critical thing that education you know, was requisite to provide for that. Uh, again, as in sports, education was considered to be character building, so we want to create good citizens. And of course, once again, this also ties back into nationalism. If we can create strong citizens through education, then we will be stronger as a nation. Now, another aspect of this time period is urbanization. People are pouring into the cities of Europe, and these cities are growing dramatically. In fact, you can see in the chart here, by 1891, over 62% of people in England and Wales are living in cities of over 10,000 people. One third are living in cities greater than 100,000 people. So this urbanization is going to create a lot of opportunities, but it's also going to create an entirely new set of problems. Some of the biggest problems had to do with health and sanitation. Obviously, when you're crowding lots of people together, you get an awful lot of waste, a lot of garbage. And of course, at this time period, city services were nowhere near what we would consider adequate today. So these cities often become hotbeds of disease and other problems associated with poor sanitation. And another problem, which really hasn't changed much from today, is crime. Of course, as you get large numbers of people together, there's always going to be a criminal element. And various types of crime, rape, robbery, murder, things that would be familiar to a modern-day city dweller, plagued these cities as well. Perhaps the most famous example, of course, is London's Jack the Ripper, who carried out a series of gruesome murders in the 1870s. So again, as governments are playing a greater role in citizens' lives, they begin to respond to these problems. And all across Europe, we see city governments and nations taking steps to remedy these issues. Uh, Paris is a very good example under Napoleon III. Uh, he hires a gentleman by the name of Baron Haussmann to essentially redesign the entire city. Now, it's a kind of an extreme example, but Paris basically undergoes nearly a complete renovation. Uh, the old ancient medieval center of the city is basically torn down. The debris is hauled away, and new buildings and new avenues are then constructed. 
The end result of Haussmann's reforms is the Paris that we know today with these very wide avenues and boulevards extending into the center of the city. Now it's important that part of these renovations had health concerns because they do build a new sewer system, for example, and also by breaking up the old narrow streets, they allow more sunlight and air into the city center. Now, another concern, of course, though, is to cater to these new middle classes. So Napoleon III made sure that the city center of Paris had museums, had department stores, restaurants, things that would attract and keep the middle class there. So he's definitely catering to those middle class tastes with these renovations. Now, something else Napoleon III had in mind, but perhaps didn't publicly state, is that by creating these new wide avenues, he's making it a lot more difficult for revolutionaries because let's face it, those big wide streets are really difficult to barricade. So he's definitely thinking about the revolutions of 1830 and 1832 and 1848, and he's thinking about how he could respond to them should they happen again. So by breaking up these old narrow streets and creating much wider ones, it's going to make it a lot difficult for would-be revolutionaries to block the streets and keep the army from maintaining control. Now again, the public health issues remain pretty rampant as well, but gradually those issues start to come under control also. Uh, one of the big advances was the development of the germ theory of disease. Uh, surgeons like Joseph Lister, uh, and others began to make the connection between bacteria and infection and illness. And once this connection is made, people begin to understand how sanitation can prevent sickness. So these changes that are made in the medical field actually began to spill over into the field of public health and city planning. So for example, many major European cities like London and Paris began to construct sewer systems. And of course, the purpose of these systems is to remove waste from the cities. Uh, the waste is carted away out of the city so it can no longer contaminate the drinking water. Now, as far as drinking water goes, cities also began to develop dedicated drinking water systems which keep pure water supplied to the citizens. Uh, in addition to these things, they start beginning things like garbage collection and street cleaning, uh, as well as education campaigns with their citizens to help discourage the spread of filth and uh, the sickness in those weeds, by those means. Now again, the issue of crime is addressed by the development of professional police forces. Now these were initially sort of unpopular when they first began, but as time went by, and these forces became much better at their jobs, uh, citizens began to appreciate having the police around. And uh, in particular, they became icons in some places, such as the famous London Bobbies. Uh, and these police forces then began to you know, combat the crime, which was plaguing a lot of these cities. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so to summarize, the middle class is becoming the dominant class, and they set the standards for a range of things across European culture. And remember, the, key, the middle class is not a homogenous group, but it ranges from very wealthy individuals to the lower middle class, or petite bourgeoisie. Mass society begins to be formed all across Europe. People are taking part in common activities, common leisure times and governments are assuming greater roles in the lives of their citizens. As urbanization continues, there's a whole new wave of problems with sanitation, crime, and other problems related to that. And gradually, governments address these problems through increased awareness of sanitation, public works projects, and the creation of professional police forces. Well, all right, Rams, that's our look at urbanization, so I do hope you enjoyed, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.